Now I'm going to read uh, three or four pieces, all very short. And uh, the first one I'm going to start off with is called Public Display of Affection. I'm going to skip the first paragraph. And in the first paragraph, I am playing old man basketball, which I was playing until about three years ago. And in, in a wise decision, I better just hang it up. And, uh, and so I'm off to the drinking fountain. I pushed off the bench and made my way to the drinking fountain by the baseball diamond. On the muddy trail to the watering hole, I spied a ponytail girl reading my chapter novel, Muddy Soul. She was seated comfortably on the grass, absorbed in a narrative in which the main character moves from Chicago's Pilsen neighborhood to the suburbs of the Plains. Published in 2005, the novel came with a doll. Some would reverse this order and say the doll came with a book. In a very short period of time, one splendid November, the book became my best seller. 250,000 dolls went home with girls. Whether the novel was read or not, I didn't care one bit. I, turncoat poet, received a sack of money that I swung first over my right shoulder and then my left shoulder. It was a really heavy sack. Hi, I said to the girl, eager to admit that yes, I wrote that book. What do you think of it? Do you have any questions for me, author of this charming tale? The girl gazed upward, using her finger as a bookmark. She was halfway through, and if memory served, Marisol, the girl hero, was searching for her cat, Rascal. You know, I continued, advancing the conversation, I, I wrote that book. I smiled to give her evidence that, in spite of my sweaty appearance, I was an all right guy. When she returned in a different scowl, as if beholding a piece of irrelevant gum embedded in the sidewalk, I reeled in my smile. Nothing, nothing stirred in her. Nothing moved her to utter, oh really? I hurried away to the drinking fountain and drank my fill in rapid gulps afraid that the girl might skip off to her parents and report, a dirty old man tried to talk to me. Then I headed home without raising my eyes to the rearview mirror. This relationship was like over. <laughs> Later I considered that incident was not unlike a compact mirror, a piece of glass, a shattered tail light in the street. It reflected on my narrow experience. I had finally gotten my wish to see a reader albeit a child reader, with a book of mine at hand. I had been awestruck by other authors, big shots like John Grisham and Stephen King, and the hefty sales that kept them ni living nicely. Well, what was their reaction when they came upon a reader turning the page of one of their books? Perhaps after the first elated encounter, the experience grows tiresome, a big yawner. Mr. Grisham expects readers, as does Mr. King. They expect their books to rise in the barometer of the bestseller list. Movies are made from the works of such authors. Even when no movies are made, they appear, at least on the Charlie Rose show. This is not my story, though. I've done my song and dance for producers and directors and have written Oprah. Isn't it time for, for a poet to be on your show, slender Hispanic? Very appealing to be crowned on your show. The response from the global network, silence. And the piece goes on, but it illustrates just kind of like uh, the yearning for poets to be recognized. I mean, we, we, we handle language, we work with language every day, and then, you know, when a book comes out, it, uh, you know, you get your thing on the, on the wall like this, and uh, um, you, know, you get on the roll, you know, the Charlie Rose show, and uh, other things happen, but not for poets. And this is a, uh, my, one of my major influences is a um, Danish-Norwegian novelist by the name of Knut Hansen. He has a book, a wonderful book called Hunger. And Hunger is sort of a uh, coming of age. Well, it's more than that. It's actually, he's already come of age. He's been neglected and he's further neglected. And so there's one little scene in the book of his called Hunger where he doesn't even have the power to sort of blow a, a bee away. He's sitting on a bench the bee sitting on the bench as well, the little, little thing like that, and he tries to blow it away, and the, the bee kind of just hunkers down, because I'm not moving. Yeah, so he realizes, 
I didn't have a power to prove this guy, yeah, let alone people with a, my sad little story. So there's, there's sort of a, in the text here, there's sort of a self-pity kind of thing working. But believe me, I'm doing okay in life. And, uh, but I'm working that angle, thinking of uh, Knut Hampson. In fact, I do have a book titled The Effects of Knut Hampson on a Fresno Boy. So it's not like I'm making it up right now. He's a poet, a writer, who had sort of this, this magical touch on me. This is, this is called The Oakland Zoo. I lingered in front of the chimp's cage, having had enough of the motion, motionless elephant and the clacking of the toucan's beak. The bird was hidden behind leaves as if on a veil audition. The frantic pace of the wolverine was unnerving. The llama's chewing cud made me want to shout, okay fella, swallow. <laughs> the, bear, the bear slept, the peacock dragged her ballroom ground, gown across pebbles. The rhino was knee deep in a leaf strewn pond with a free loading pelican on his wrinkled back. Now I was facing a lone chimp, a representative from those picking lice in the corner. He had strolled over with his chimp, with his chimp gate. And instead of pushing a begging hand at me, his small, whiskery face showed worry. Had he heard that a major publisher had shown me the door? Chimp, I said in my heart, I once wrote a story about your kind lost on a raft. Noah had pulled away. Noah pulled up the anchor. You poor swimmers were trying to catch up. He wouldn't have known of that, of course. Included in a book called Help Wanted, the story appears to be unknown to everyone except me and the publisher. And this good librarian over here who brought the book. Here's Help Wanted. <laughs> I was moody. I had walked through a dark cloud of rejection. Not rejection per se, but the absence of a response to my manuscripts. The company hadn't said goodbye by telephone, email, or by letter. It hadn't even let me go with a secondhand smoke of rumor. After a 20-year relationship, Harcourt, now Hooft and Mifflin Harcourt, simply refused to acknowledge me. I had come full circle. The merry-go-round of success had slowed to a stop. It was time to get off my high horse and saddle up a bottle. The chimp rattled the fence. He offered me a smile, teeth crooked as dice, and gestured with a hand, no with a finger. From the end of this digit, he offered me a dab of moist snot. <laughs> Was this a delicacy in the primate world? He stretched his arm through the fence as far as it would, it would reach. I shamefully stepped back. He in turn withdrew his arm. Were his feelings hurt? <laughs> Or was he just teasing me? He tasted the snot, ate it with gusto, then pushed his finger back into his nose. Somewhere in another cage, a water buffalo was snorting. The toucan continued to clack its beak. When the peacock, a peacock cried, a shepherd of birds hit the sky. I looked back at the chip and smiled. He was offering me one of the best things I had received in a very long time. And I think, I, you know, I, I should have taken that little, that little thing on his finger, but no, I was too good for that. You know. He was trying to make me feel good. Okay, now this one is going to be a little long, but not that long, and it involves something I'm going to show you in just a sec. The smallest is called, the story is called Aaga. A, new word, A-G-A. And you'll see why it's called Aaga. The smallest book in my poetry collection is written, no, dictated and illustrated by J Jake Gordon Young, son of Gary Young, poet and printer. It measures three inches by four inches and has a collector's quality to the production. Handset uh, Garamond type, handmade paper called Umbria, handbound in green cloth with a decorative label tiny as a square of confetti on the spine. The la label reads, uh, Aga. Published in 1992, there are only 75 such copies in the world. It's short on stature when placed next to, say, Pablo Neruda's collected works. Still, if Neruda was alive, he would take a look at it, read it in less than a minute, and pronounce it a rare, rare beginning. 
It is rare, and it is a beginning. Master Jake dictated this book when he was just out of his pampers. His father told me the manuscript was created in New York City while Jake was suffering from the deliriums of mononucleosis. At three years old, the child was already experiencing a rimbo moment. He lay in bed, sweaty from fever, and yet, and yet art was on his mind. When his father asked, can I get you anything, the child responded, ink and paper. The storyline of Aaga is classic. A very good fellow is riding a horse and comes upon bad dudes doing bad dude things. The good fellow slaughters them. With permission, I quote a passage. I saw another bad guy and stabbed him in the heart, his chest, his whole body. There are such, other, uh, there are such passages, including one about a deer that is eaten by a narrator and a new sidekick from the forest. In the end, the narrator, okay, Jake, finds a girl and lives happily ever after. Now, here's the book. So I'm going to pass it around. You can take a look at it. But I'm, not, I'm going to still continue a few more paragraphs that explores Jake, who is three years old, dictates, and actually does the artwork for this book. And um, there's more to this because um, and it, he's, you know, he's, he's suffering, this poor little guy. Uh, okay, I continue with the same story. Gary Young is a poet, teacher, and fine press printer. We first met in, as classmates in the MFA program at UC Irvine. Gary was a year ahead of me, a little more settled in life, married for instance, and with an idea of what he wanted to do with his life, and had a gentle artistic side to his character. I could judge this by his penmanship, which was artful and beautiful to behold. My penmanship was clumsy as a kid walking with Pepsi cans smashed on his sneakers. Gary published his uh, son's book in a limited edition, and he also brought out other books, marvelous works, uh, particularly those of Marla May. Uh, Gary's books have been collected by major museums in the United States, and particularly abroad in Japan. He and his wife and children live in a forest, and this is a tr the truth, not a legend. And live close to the bone, meaning that things can be very tight financially. I skipped just a bit. In 1993, Gary visited Chronicle Books of San Francisco, which was publishing my poetry at the time. He visited with an editor, was it Jay Schaefer, and shared samples of his fine press books, including a seductive, masterful work of Mahler May's poetry. The editor, though, he crunched the numbers and said, well, it would be too expensive to publish. The editor then asked, do you have any something else? To answer that question, Gary pulled out a uh, Aga, mm -hmm. yeah, for, possibly from his coat pocket. Chronicle Books, enchanted by the size and authorship, published the pint-sized book a year later. Jake was in kindergarten. By then, feeling his shoes with sand by jumping up and down in the sandbox. His advance was $5,000. <laughs> With that princely sum, he could have bought his classmates ice cream for the year. The book sold mod modestly, and Drew Jake grew up to be a poet. Once a slayer of bad guys, he recently received his MFA in creative writing. On the graduate school application, Jake Gordon Young provided uh, Aga as evidence of publication. <laughs> so can you imagine a guy already three years old and he's better published than his father? <laughs> you know, bigger advance and all that, kind of being a major publisher. And, uh, now we can't publish you, but yeah, your son, hey, we like his work, man. And so on. I'm going to stop here for a second. I'm going to read maybe two more pieces and then uh, very short pieces. Uh, but let's have a little conversation before uh, we end the evening. I really appreciate your coming out on a Wednesday. I know... Uh, you know, we're all busy, we're all travel different places, from different, uh, different areas. Uh, any questions you'd like to ask this poet? Mm, is it a charming book though, sir? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Do you consider yourself a poet before you consider yourself an author or a both? Poet. Poet. Mm -hmm. You know, you know me as a, a person who does these middle grade uh, novels. And, yeah. yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. no, I'm a poet. I do these other things. And actually, I stopped uh, doing the middle grade uh, fiction uh, several years ago. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anything else here? Um, are you the, you know, I noticed in your books that a lot of them revolve around like young men, early 20s, living in Fresno, trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Is that, mm -hmm. you? Is that me? Uh, you know, there, I think there's always a little of the author in, uh, mm -hmm. in works, whether they will admit it or not. So, now if you said, are you the person who is tall, dark, and handsome? I would immediately say yes <laughs> at one time, but you know, you sort of made some general statements. So I, yeah, I, I would say I think I'm a little of those uh, those characters in the in the books. If you have to, you know, you have to kind of place yourself, you know, emotionally. You know, you can see yourself in some of the novels, um, in the short stories. But this is all of me. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, okay, I'm going to read you a really very short uh, thing. It's like. Uh, Think about your first memory on this troubled planet of ours. And uh, this one involves, right away, greed. And I was kind of like, already, think of all the, the bad things that, uh, you know, that you're offered, uh, all the temptations, and greed is one of them. And I experienced it right away, as you'll see. It's only one little page long. It's called M&M's, as in the, the candy. How much memory is enough? How much can a writer siphon off from the gorge heart of experience and yet have the heart still pump? If one cares about the mystery of childhood, as a good many poets do, then the well is amazingly deep. The subjects rebound, sometimes effortlessly, sometimes with the stubbornness of a frog that won't leap. I'm thinking of my flickering life, age four, and me standing late at night on the back porch where my brother and I slept. I'm eating M&M's, examining each one by the glow of the street light, street light at the corner of Van Ness and Braley Avenues. I'm searching for the red ones, tastier than the green, yellow, and orange ones, even better than the brown ones. This was one of my first memories, me with my horde of M&Ms. I was protective of them, greedy. My brother was in the cot, asleep. Good news for me. I had no plans to share. This was my life and this was me, age four, partially lit by a light on the street that I had yet to cross. Oh, you know, it's a terrible feeling. Oh, let's see, okay, I'm going to, uh, one other question then uh, as I look around for what I really want to read. Okay. This comes from um, trying to write a bestseller. And I, I actually immediately have tried to write a bestseller. I don't know how, you know, the author of the Harry Potter novels does it. Mm -hmm. You know, 800 pages of really bad prose. <laughs> I mean, uh, how does that, I mean, she continues, you know, after a while you think, oh, okay, put the camera's up, uh, 800 pages of really good prose. <laughs> this is me here. You know, kind of again, that mood is like, uh, a little bit of self-pity. My cat was staring at an uncooked pinto bean on their kitchen floor. As I was alone with my failure to reach a reading public, I spoke to the cat. Little buddy, I asked, know what this is? My little buddy pawed the bean toward the stove. He licked his chops. What a genius for a creature with a brain the size of a pinto bean. He could see that that ancient seed must be first boiled. The cat washed his front paws with three licks. Little buddy, I confided, I have an idea for a new, new poem. You want to hear it? But before telling him, I held up a can of ocean-flavored cat food in order to deepen our man-cat relationship. <laughs> I was introducing the can, op can opener to him when a hummingbird suddenly hovered at the window. A braggart of a bird, bright as costume jewelry, his torso toy-like, his beak laser-thin. The bird is all flash, I told myself, like some poets I know. He was gone before I could look up, uh, to, uh, look him in the eye. Just me and my buddy cat again. When I opened the can, he pranced, the dinner bell on his collar ringing. My cat was born dressed black and black, 
with a bib of a napkin white on his chest. He would mix nicely at the awards ceremony for the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> oh, I'm not going there. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, one question is, uh, I scan for something I really want to read, and I uh, end with that. Uh, I've got one more. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. well, I do think there, it seems, as a librarian, it's really hard to, to get books by Latino authors for young adults. I'm just wondering. Oh, where do we begin there? You know, I'm not an educator. I'm not a uh, you know, person who does you know, statistics. But, uh, you know, numbers are not, not great for a lot of Latino youth. Uh, you know, dropout rate in a lot of uh, cities, you know, 50%. You yeah. know, those who continue, you know, with the, the, the dwindle factor does occur. And then when you're in college, you know, you say, well, gee, man, I, man, I don't want to go into writing. This is like hey, a sure course for poverty. And uh, so, you know, people go into accounting, engineering, medicine, teaching, librarianship. So it is it is hard. Even though a good many of us have that, that great desire to to want to write. I mean, there's something inside us that, you know, once it makes it sing, uh, you know, makes some sort of beauty. Right now, I'm taking Ikebana, uh, Sogetsu uh, school, one of my uh, friends is here from that school. And so, you're like, creating, like, beauty is, like, really kind of interesting. And uh, I never thought I would think, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't think about this flower stuff. And all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, I'm in this class, but I even have a little apron. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of like wanting to create something. But I think a lot of people, Latino youth, they say they make wise decisions. They say, if I'm there, I'm going to try to do this thing, you know, you know called, you know, you know, uh, you know where I can, there's a job at the end of, uh, uh, end of the road. And it's, it's hard. It, it is very hard, uh, you know, to maintain, especially after, you know, you know however long, like a, a career at this thing. And I've been writing, the first book came out when I was 23. And uh, I'm no longer 23, so it's, I'm still at it, still going. And a lot of people just kind of, you know, go away. Okay, my last piece. I again, I really appreciate you coming out. Uh, uh, okay, now some of you may remember Herb Cain. How many remember Herb Cain? Okay, a few of us. Now he was a he was a wit, and. Um, He's known for his three-dot journalism. And so I'm just going to read you a portion of this. And uh, Herb Cain entertained while he provided insight into the human follies. Into human follies. A few of his columns have stayed with me. Example, a billionaire computer type is given a party at a swank resort in Napa. On check-in, a visitor is told that at 10 o'clock in the evening, Mr. Billionaire will provide for his guests an awesome display of fireworks. The visitor signing his name in the guest book, passe these days, then bothered to meet the receptionist's eyes. He tells the person behind the counter, oh, that's nice. Fireworks for his guests? I promise I won't look. Another example, a family of three, dad, mom, and son, is having dinner at a four-star restaurant. Mom asks the son, age four, and dressed in a child's blazer, what he would like to drink with his meal. He looks thoughtfully around at the other diners, turns back to his mother, and says, a glass of Chablis. The mother smiles and says, no, 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 we can't drink wine in public. At that, the boy sighs. He again lets his eyes patrol the other diners before he makes his call. Okay, a cup of coffee, black. <laughs> Mr. King wasn't around for this. A famous film director flies to France and darn it, the film director lives around here by the way. He has forgotten two bottles of some delectable red, some smoky bullshit with a swimmingly fat ass body. He could have smacked his brow, oh my gosh the flat of his palm and ended it at that. But, but he is throwing a party for his chums in a fortnight. He can't disappoint. As a daddy with mucho zeros on the end of a nine, he is the kind who understands, with the help of his accountant, the tax write-off. He hires a private jet to fly over these bottles of wine, each buckled in. I imagine, each jostled through the spat of turbulence over the North Pole. 
but each arriving safely. As they were bottles, not people or living creatures, they weren't forced to go through customs. I suspect that they poured, they were poured in after a sw secondary swill in a large wine glass, some nonsense was issued over the wine. We've all spent money foolishly. I once bought a bottle of Pepino for $50 and strapped it in into my passenger seat. The ride home was only six, block, six blocks, but I wasn't about to take a chance on that baby. <laughs> but can you imagine, you're so wealthy, you forgot your wine at home, oh my god, I'll just get a little jet, just fly it over and, uh, so you can be there at the party. Is that, is that a waste? Okay, one of the last questions, and I'm going to be done here. It's, again, a pleasure to be at the Book Passage. Uh, when, when Bruce, please. Okay. So when I hear you read the, the Greek piece of the Unleavened, mm -hmm. or the last line of the little buddy story of Pinto Bean, yeah. I'm thinking, oh, am I hearing a poem? Am I hearing, and I was, I thought of a, 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 a sculptor with a block of stone, and He's chiseling, and I wondered if you had kept chiseling. Did you think, well, I really am not going to keep chiseling? If I, this doesn't have the right makeup for a poem, but it's a story? Or no, there, there are stories. I think this is my complaint about a lot of writers, and I mentioned one uh, maybe unfairly, mm -hmm. is that they, they have an idea, they, they rush the rusty idea, you know, you get the plot, you get all this stuff, but the prose itself is so uninteresting. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a poet, I have some command of language, mm -hmm. And I think I have to take it over to prose as well. I simply can't be kind of like sort of a generalist and just sort of present the image, but really just really, really, you know, work on that sentence or work on that image. And I think that's a responsibility of, of prose writers as well. Uh, factor someone, poetry is, should be as well written as, as prose, you know, or the, it could be the reverse as well. And that, uh, and there's a, there's a lot of writers, very popular ones, who just uh, can't do it. And they think that just the story itself is going to carry it. And actually, there are best sellers, and uh, but then the command is not it's not there. Again, thank you very much. Let's give it up just a little bit.